Hi, I'm Senator Malcolm Roberts, and I'm in Australia's Federal Parliament House in Canberra. And I'm with Professor David LeGates from the University of Delaware in the United States. So you graduated with a science degree in, from the University of Delaware in 1982, and then, and then a Master of Science from the University of Delaware in 1985, and a PhD from the University of Delaware in 1988. So you went through pretty quickly and did that. You, but you haven't just been at Delaware which is where you are back now, but you've taught at Louisiana State University, the University of Oklahoma, and the University of Virginia. What do you think of our response to CSIRO? Are we doing the science correctly? I think you are. I think, that, and that's the way it should be done. They need to, they need to keep explaining themselves and why they're doing, why they're suggesting things that they're suggesting. Because you as a policymaker have to come back and say, if you can't st show me there's a problem, why am I enacting any solutions? Let's talk about uh, the global, uh, the general circulation models, the, 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 um, the models that the IPCC is uses. We know they haven't got the data. We know they haven't got the causal logic. So instead they fabricate models. What can you tell us about these models that the whole of this policy is based on? First of all, the climate system is probably the most complex system that exists short of life on earth. Okay, so to think that we have, we can understand all of the processes intricately, because it's not just understanding the process, it's being able to model it at a spatial scale that we just simply cannot run a model. Uh, and so therefore, a lot of things are happening at very small spatial scales, I mean, it's just physically impossible to be able to simulate the climate. So we make assumptions. We can't simulate cloud processes, so we pretend clouds form in a different process. And as, as you said, I deal with precipitation, so the first thing I want to see is does, does precipitation, let's say, for uh, June 6th, uh, 2083, does that look like a reasonable weather map? They said, well, we're not supposed to be simulating weather. No, but I want to see, is there, are, are the processes there? Is there a front going through that's creating precipitation? Is there maybe a tropical system brewing in, in a, the Gulf of Mexico or maybe in, in uh, Indonesia uh, that, that's going? Are, uh, do we see precipitation going up slope, creating rainfall in mountainous regions? In other words, are the processes being represented. Unfortunately, in precipitation, essentially what you see is what, what we refer to as popcorn precipitation. Everything is convective. It's sort of, if the surface gets hot, air starts to rise, you get condensation and precipitation. There are almost no simulations of organized systems that move around the planet like we see. So we average long-term periods to get average weather conditions, average rainfall, and surprisingly, the deserts are dry, the rainforests are wet. It sort of looks like what we would expect, but we're probably getting reasonable answers for the wrong reason. Because what I want to see is that the process is being represented. I don't care that the model can simulate uh, hurricanes, uh, willy willies, or whatever that happens um, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80 years out. What I want to see is that the model simulates a process that gives us precipitation, and they don't. Now you say, well, that's precipitation. But you got to remember, because precipitation is virtually everywhere in the climate system, then it, it exchanges energy from the surface. You get condensation in the atmosphere. So energy is removed from the surface, produced in the atmosphere. It moves from polar region or from the tropics towards polar regions. The oceans circulate. Essentially, you've got to get precipitation right because if you get it wrong, you're going to get everything else wrong. The heating is going to be incorrect. The way the energy is being reproduced into the atmosphere is wrong. The way uh, water is falling on the surface, which changes the albedo from wetting the surface. I mean, all of that gets affected by getting precipitation wrong. So the way I say it is anything you do wrong in precipitation shows up everywhere else on a climate model, and everything you do wrong in a climate model feeds back and will make your precipitation wrong. If you get the wind directions incorrect, you've got the wind coming in from the wrong area, you're not bringing in moisture from the appropriate area, you're not going up slope in, in mountains in the correct direction, 
it just is a mess. And precipitation is clearly the case where we can't do that well because it's all subgrid scale process. That is, it happens on almost a molecular scale because as we see clouds formation, I mean, that's the other thing. I'm flying from Frankfurt to uh, Nigeria and the sun comes up and I'm over the middle Sahara Desert and I open the window and look out and what do I see? Clouds. It's the Sahara Desert. It's supposed to be dry. And it is. It still is dry. But there's clouds being formed. So clouds are where you've got the moisture condensing, the energy is given off. There's not enough moisture coming together to produce rain droplets. So the desert remains a desert. But you still have all the other process of the energy transfer over the Sahara Desert. And so all of that is happening in a very complicated manner that we just can't simply simplify into a climate model. And that's one reason why the climate model is so bad. And then you get into the argument is that climate, that, that the carbon dioxide effect is a tunable parameter. How important would you like carbon dioxide to be? I can build a model that has virtually no carbon dioxide impact whatsoever, or I can make it that carbon dioxide is simply the most important variable and doubling carbon dioxide will create a 10 to 15 degrees Celsius warming. It's all tunable. And that's where the problem arises. So let me just jump on a couple of those points you've just made. If my model says more carbon dioxide will lead to very high temperature, then when I run my model with increased carbon dioxide levels, we'll forecast very high temperatures. Well, sorry, we'll project very high temperatures. Correct. So it's, yes. it, it, there's, there's no real science in that it's just just a method of saying oh i think that more carbon dioxide will cause more temperature no basis right. that's all right. it is and and if if i happen to think that um that carbon dioxide has minimal impact then my model the, the, the equations in the model will simply say okay slight increases of temperature so for for increases my large increases of carbon dioxide and so when i run my model it'll show minimal impact because right. my belief drives the model output, not the data. I mean, that is insane. That's not science. That's the dirty little secret. And that's the article that came out in 2017, 2018, that, about that time frame in the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society that talked about tunable parameters and model tuning. And the, <laughs> the idea was, you know, we don't want to really say this in public because the climate naysayers, the deniers are going to say, well, see that, you know, this is how why models are no good, but it's exactly why models are problematic. If this is something I have decided beforehand is going to happen, then my model is simply going to reflect what I want it to say and not what really happens. And therefore, all bets are off. I'm, I'm putting my thumb on the scale. I'm changing the outcome based upon what I want to see. So garbage in, garbage out. Flawed assumption. Flawed thought process, you got flawed results. And yet, and yet, in the sole chapter claiming warming and attributing it to carbon dioxide in the UN climate bodies report in 2007, that was chapter nine. In 2001, it was chapter 12. In 2013, it was chapter 10. When you read that carefully, you see, when you read it uh, loosely, you see, oh, the data shows this, the data shows that, and the data, oh, I think, oh we're onto something here. But then you realize that the data is output from models. It's not data, and yet they, that's their data. So there's no data in the sole chapter in each, each of the IPCC reports, the sole chapter claiming warming and attributing carbon dioxide. There is no empirical uh, data proving that at, and what's more is misleading because they're claiming it's data when it's just a bunch of model outputs and the models are flawed. We, we know they're unvalidated and we know they're erroneous, completely fried. Model output is not data. Yes. And, and you also mentioned that the impossibility of using these models because I just want to explain a term you used or, or get you to explain it. You said the weather effects can be on sub-grid scale. The grid around the world that they have these nodes for the for the models are sometimes hundreds of miles apart, and yes. so some storm might be within that grid entirely and not even seen in the model. So right. you can't model the the key energy movements in the atmosphere. I mean, think about where you live and go 50 miles in each direction. 
I mean, you can get quite a bit different land surface conditions. You can have different rainfall patterns. You can have, I mean, all sorts of things can vary. But the model can't see that because the model sees that cell as being uniform in every way, shape, and form. Well, that's now, the, goal, the goal is to make it smaller and smaller. The problem, though, is then it becomes much more complex because the interactions have to run on a faster time scale, and we still don't understand all of the physics that describes everything. So it just Thank becomes, you. yeah, that's not the solution. It's yes, not just I, take the resolution smaller. But not a, so the two things there really probably many things. Uh, one is the the, um, the the computing power you need is just not possible, not even close. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't do it. But even if we could do it computationally, we can't do it um, with our understanding of climate because we don't understand how these factors intermesh. Because right. there are so many cycles, and when you get when you get uh, eleven year cycles, fifteen year cycles, twenty year cycles, eighteen year cycles, forty year cycles, one um, hundred fifty million year cycles, eleven hundred year cycles, when they all mesh, and then you've got a daily cycle, a seasonal cycle, annual cycle. When they all mesh, it just goes like this. It's all over the place. And you can't make sense out of that. But remember, too, the climate system is inherently chaotic. That is, it's a nonlinear dynamics problem. Yep. And so as a result, it doesn't necessarily follow a straight line. It can meander all over the place, like a, like a river does. You're right. And you can't predict it. So that's where the problem becomes, is that a lot of these things happen and you just, you know, we don't necessarily see them happening in the model in the way in which they happen in the real world. Right, and so even something as basic as clouds, and I know when a cloud goes over on a hot summer day here, the temperature temperature drops enormously. And, and even the drop itself depends upon what, what else is happening on the day, my geography, where I'm located, et cetera. So okay. when, when that happens, it shows just how powerful a cloud is, or the powerful the effect of a cloud is, and yet they can't model clouds properly. And yet small, di small differences in cloud cover and they do occur from year to year, dramatically impact the temperature. Yeah. And yet they, don't, they can't, can't model that.